Turning uh, to a provincial issue, almost 400,000 individuals in Ontario relied on ODSP in the month of March this year. That is the Ontario Disability Support Program. An individual on the Ontario Disability Support Program gets a maximum of $1,053 per month. For a single person, that is almost $7,000 a year below the poverty line as set by Statistics Canada. And I am joined on the phone now by John Stapleton, the author of a report, What Keeps Us From Working, which looked at the barriers and obstacles faced by ODS. ODSP recipients as they attempt to return to work or to obtain work. Good morning, John. Good morning. John, who who was behind this report that you're the author of? Who provided the funding to look into the challenges faced by ODSP recipients? Well, it's really th- three groups. Uh, the first is the Dream Team, which is a group of psychiatric survivors. The second is the uh, CAMH, which is the Center for its Addictions and the Mental Health, and the third is HouseLink, which is a support group for uh, people in in housing. John, when you when you looked at the the barriers out there, and what stood in the way of recipients receiving Ontario Disability Support Program payments to finding work, what did you find? Well, it's really two two things. The first is the um, structure of the program itself, and uh, you, you already mentioned how low the allowances are. But when someone starts to work, they uh, lose fifty cents on each dollar that they that they make right from the very first dollar. The second thing is really the uh, the administration of the program. And it is so closely administered. Um, every change, everything that happens each month, is uh, it has to be recorded into the system. And uh, uh, and when there's these delays and uh, three pay months and things like that, uh, it causes real issues. And so, after looking at uh, at the fifty percent clawback. What sort of hurdles does that does that pose? I mean, presumably people are are still getting their ODSP check, and so if they're only getting half of their their income from their job, it's it's still more income than they would have had before. Uh, why is that such a discouragement uh, to working? Well, it starts from the very first dollar, and uh, usually when somebody starts a job, they're going to have work expenses. They're going to have various hurdles to get over. Uh, they may have to move. They may have to um, buy work clothes and that sort of thing. And it's getting over that initial hurdle that's really the difficulty. Um, how how closely integrated or not integrated is the, the clawback together with other programs such as subsidized rent, which I know often looks at an individual's total income or other supports that people may be receiving? Well, that's one of the real problems. Uh, we have all these different programs that support people, not just subsidized housing, but there's also uh, legal aid, child care programs. And they each look at the d- dollar that is made by an ODSP recipient. So at the same time, the, the, you have the 50 cents coming off the check, uh, you also have uh, rent uh, that starts to skyrocket almost from the beginning. So when you were looking at uh, these issues, what what recommendations uh, was your group able to come up with in the report that you think could ease the path into, uh, into paying work for recipients on the Ontario Disability Support Program? Well, the very first one was to look at the very first year that somebody makes money and to parallel what subsidized housing is going to do and uh, in in this instance uh, to uh, allow us three hundred dollar a month exemption on earnings and also to increase the amounts that people get for uh, uh, 
their uh, uh, bonuses that they get for working. When it's called a work-related benefit, that we said should go to one hundred and fifty dollars a month, and uh, uh, we also uh, propose the idea of going to yearly reconciliation of earnings, so that uh, uh, people are able to do the very same things that uh, that happen with the uh, with an armorial utility bill, where you're able to go. Um, uh, a year on flat monthly billings. Well, we we, uh, we wanted to have uh, the same sort of concept here, so that someone would know exactly what they're going to get for a year, and uh, maybe at the end of that year, they'd have the opportunity to uh, leave the program if work is uh, working out for them, so to speak. And what are what are the the real benefits of going to that yearly instead of monthly uh, reconciliation? Because in my head, the fear, I guess, would be that someone, based on on the estimates, uh, would find themselves behind or owing money at at the end of the year if if they had increased their work hours or picked up additional work. Yeah, the the, the we're not really saying that that we we should go away from monthly reporting of income. We're talking about monthly reconciliation, and there is an important distinction between the two. Uh, on the one hand. Uh, uh, if somebody starts back to work, uh, the, the importance of having uh, the yearly reconciliation is that they will know for the first year exactly what they're going to get. They can plan their lives. They're going to have the stability of of knowing exactly uh, where their financial uh, where their finances are going. And then we also propose, rather than looking at uh, if, if someone has a large uh, overpayment uh, at the end of the year because of the uh, because of the amounts that have been estimated on a monthly basis, the same thing can happen with a hydro bill, is that we would reconcile that forward, not reconcile it backwards. Excellent. I think the other thing that shocked me uh, in looking at, at your report and, and the Toronto Star's reporting on it were a couple of examples of what to me were really shocking administrative uh, screw-ups that very deeply impacted the lives of ODSP recipients. Uh, there's one case in there. Sharon Burfind was told she had to liquidate her life insurance policy because the program has an asset limit and the, the policy put her in excess of that limit. She went ahead and did that on the advice of the ODSP worker, collapsed the policy, spent the money on a weekend trip to Montreal because she had to spend the money, and was told only after the life insurance policy had been liquidated that oh, life insurance policies are, in fact, exempt, and you can keep the policy. Well, of course, at that point, it was gone. And the second story that really I found shocking was that of Michael Koo, who had indicated that, you know, finding finally moving into a bachelor apartment after years of, of living in rooming houses and other shared accommodation had been great for his for his mental health, had been great for, for how he was feeling and his self-esteem, found himself one month uh, where his work hours were a little unpredictable and uh, the ODSP payments, the way they had cal- been calculated, caused him to fall behind on a month's rent. His worker suggested suggested a solution, said, why don't you authorize direct payment straight out of the program to your landlord? Michael Koo did this on, on that recommendation, but there was an administrative screw-up uh, at the ODSP office. His rent was never paid. His employer started, or his landlord started to harass his employer for the money, and Mr. Koo now is unemployed again and facing facing eviction, about to become homeless, and it seems about to become homeless, if if I can be permitted to editorialize, due to a kind of administrative callousness. And my question is, how can how can this be happening? How can this kind of level of administrative screw ups be happening in a system designed to serve some of the most vulnerable Ontarians? Well, really, I think it's a structural problem, and the, the, there's so many rules, and there's so uh, close an administration in the first instance that even no matter how many people you put to administer it, it's going to be constantly clogged with paperwork and uh, and administrative, yeah, and it doesn't leave people the time to uh, to work with the, the clientele. Thank you uh, so much for for joining us this morning, Mr. Stapleton. If listeners want to locate a full copy of the report, I know the report has been picked up uh, in the Toronto Star a couple of days ago, and also there was an editorial. But if listeners want to locate a full copy of the report, where should they look for it? 
Uh, they can go on the CAMH uh, website. Also, if they're reading The Star, um, it's uh, there's a link to it, and there's also on my own website, which is called openpolicyontario.com. Thank you so much for joining us bright and early this morning, Mr. Stapleton.